so you said these books are difficult. Maybe you can comment on which aspect is difficult. Is it just the technical nature? Is it the length? Is it the depth of the ideas or how long it takes to integrate them? And more sort of importantly, is there recommendation advice you can give on how to integrate these ideas, how to read, <laughs> how, <laughs> how to learn in the space? Is there from your own life, like how do you enjoy taking in ideas? And this could be for these books, but also uh, in the Bitcoin world and reading a bunch of different ideas uh, written by others, just integrating stuff, uh, even watching podcasts and all those kinds of things. Yeah, I, I'm a reader. I love to read. Um, one of the most useful things I've ever done was take a speed reading course. I actually think there's a version of this available on Tim Ferriss's website. It's like a 30 minute speed reading course. It's all about eye movement. Instead of moving your eye continuously line over line, it's more about jumping in your brain. You can train your brain to just absorb words in their totality versus kind of reading word by word. And also not I've, I've, I haven't fully taken that journey actually, but uh, I remember taking a few steps on that journey, realizing that I'm speaking inside my head. Yeah. I'm saying the words inside my head and that's actually getting in the way. That's right. So there's a lot of little hacks like that. I maybe lazily, I'll have to, now that you mentioned, I'll have to revisit this. Yeah. But I have convinced myself that I don't need to read faster because that's not ultimately the bottleneck. The bottleneck is in the me thinking about stuff. In fact, I like reading really slowly or so I convince myself. <laughs> because I, ultimately it's not about gaining more information. It's about time spent thinking deeply. Yes, yes. Um, but maybe that's just me being very lazy because yes, it's true. It's important to think deeply, but maybe I could speed up the, the <laughs> consumption of information. But it's funny. It's, I, I like to be dynamic actually. So um, usually speed reading initially and that diffused that internal dialogue for me. Cause when I was reading one word at a time, I was having that too. You almost get a feedback in your own head. Mm -hmm. You're reading the word out loud and right. it's clouding <laughs> your thoughts. Yeah. And if you're speed reading, you can't do that. Yeah. You just, you're taking in groups of words at a time. So you can't, uh, you know, internally verbalize it, I guess. And then I also am really big on annotating, underlining, writing in the margins. Uh, I prefer a physical book, but I also read the Kindle a lot cause it's just so convenient. Mm -hmm. You know, anywhere you're waiting in line or every night before bed, I'm reading my Kindle. Um, and I also advocate rereading a lot. So if you found something that, you know, struck you at a deep level, you found particularly fascinating, like you have to listen to that. That's your, I don't know, your mind or your spirit signal that that is something meaningful to you. And you should, you know, to your point, reread it, sit with it for a long time, write about it. Um, and that, that becomes the ultimate triumvirate of, of synthesizing an idea, actually. If you can read about it and then write about it and then go and talk about it, you get this crystallization of understanding that's just not possible doing any one of the three or any two of the three. Um, so I definitely highly recommend people to do that. Um, and in terms of how are those books difficult? I mean, in every way, they're all long books. Uh, in terms of density, I would say Leela is the less, the least dense, maybe maps of meaning. I don't know, but maps of meaning and human action are both extremely dense, <laughs> but they're just, you, I had to read those books very slow. They're, you just have to take your time with them. Um, to, to give you an idea with Jordan Peterson, he's said this a lot with maps of meaning. He spent three hours a day writing for 15 years to write that book. It's probably, I think it's a 600 page book. He said he estimates he rewrote every sentence in the book 50 times, five zero, to try and get it, you know, just perfected. And when you read these sentences, <laughs> you can tell that he rewrote it 50 times. I've, uh, I've used actually Anki for space repetition. Um, it's like a piece of, it's an app. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it allows you to load in uh, facts or terms or entire paragraphs. And then it brings them, uh, you review them every day, mm -hmm. and then it brings them up less and less often over time hmm. as you show yourself being able to remember the thing that uh, you wanted to memorize. And oftentimes when I'm reading, what I want to memorize is the key idea. Uh, but also like I use it for, 
I'm terrible with names, so I'm starting to use it for names too, of names of people, names of uh, like people that I want to remember. Yeah. And also throughout history and also in my own personal life, but also events, you know, dates to me are usually not important, but sometimes dates are really important. Mm. And so it's really useful. I recommend it highly. Naval, I think mentioned a piece of software called Readwise or something like that, mm. that I'm, I hope I'm saying that correctly. It's something like that. And what it does is it goes to your highlights from your Kindle or the various places where you highlight stuff that integrates with um, Goodreads. And it does the same kind of space repetition, but for things you've highlighted. Mm, that's so super cool. it's, it sends an email every day. And it's, it's been really, I recommend it highly because it, it sends like to me an email form a selection of the things I've highlighted and previous things I've read. Wow. And it's like this weird, like shock, shock to your memory yeah. of the, that sprinkles, like I'll, I'll have a, I have a way, probably way too much Orwell in there. <laughs> and it just kind of like, it brings you back. And these ideas that are, because what you realize, depending on how you highlight, but at least for me, and I think it's probably true for a lot of people, the things you've highlighted had at that moment and like an emotional impact on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so like these things are just like hitting you hard again. Yeah, it's like whoa. Uh, it might not be meaningful to anyone else except you, and it, it's uh, it's something I recommend. You never know with these like hacks or tools and so on, like what's actually BS and what what is amazing. And that one is kind of amazing. So at least for me, it works. It works for me and Naval. I think I think it's he's the read one. Readwise, you said. Readwise. Yeah, I'll do or something yeah. close to that. Yeah. It could be read something else, like yeah. read wealth or something. Uh, the one other thing I, I really like, and this is more of a new one, is I used to always listen to music at the gym, mm -hmm. but now I've just, because I'm so backlogged on podcasts, right? They're just, mm -hmm. there's so many. I exclusively listen to podcasts when I'm walking or when I'm at the gym, anytime I'm doing something that I can't you know, read, basically. And I think there's something really special about exercise and ideation. I yeah. mean, I I don't know if this happens to everyone, but my creative juices just go ballistic. When I'm at the gym, like I hit a certain point of, I guess, heart rate and you're sweating enough, then it, the ideas just start to flow. Yeah. So I'm basically at the gym now listening to podcasts, exercising as fast as I can to try to get to that state of, um, you know, where you're just straining, your strenuous exercise, I guess you would say. And then I end up typing notes into my phone as fast as I can with all these ideas that are flowing. So I've I've created a lot of good writing out of that. Yeah, it's it's kind of work. So I I do running uh, quite a bit. So running outside, and uh, I'll listen. To, <laughs> I've been okay. I told myself this has been going on for about a year. Uh, is I only listen like the the stuff that's either World War Two or World War One related. So Hitler, Stalin, <laughs> like like difficult historical stuff. Um, and also listen to brown noise. So those are the two modes. So brown noise it helps me, it's like white noise, but like deeper, I guess. It helps me remove the world. And at the gym, there's a lot of distractions. Mm -hmm. When you're running, there's a lot of distractions. It helps me remove the world. So one, I'll be listening to difficult historical ideas. And then when my mind is all of a sudden starting to generate ideas, mm -hmm. I'll listen to brown noise and I'll then force myself to think. It's kind of, it's meditative in a sense. And your mind wants to be lazy. You want to, you. it's hard, man, for like running and thinking mm -hmm. in the sense that some of the ideas that come into your head are pretty heavy. Uh, it's about your own life. It's all, your own demons come in there, yeah. but also just difficult ideas that require you thinking through and persevering through that, like not letting yourself get lazy and like thinking through it. Has, has been really for me rewarding in the same way that you're, you're saying is it is for you. It's true that like podcasts and music, like um, shallow, like funny podcasts or music have been a kind of filler distraction, mm. but informational podcasts, like podcasts that have some depths of ideas or audiobooks, have been uh, truly rewarding. I try to listen now less and less to podcasts that are just fun. Mm. 
because I feel like I enjoy it too much and I don't allow my mind to get bored and to think through stuff, mm -hmm. to uh, to explore ideas. Yeah. It's so easy to fill the the space that uh, usually would be thought, filled with thought and instead fill it with fun podcasts. Like yeah. there's a bunch of comedy podcasts I really enjoy. So there's value to that, of course, but you have to realize it's entertainment. It's not, yeah. uh, it's, it's not, um, you don't get much value except entertainment. Right, from... right. And there's utility to the boredom too, I think, oh, yeah. where to give your mind the space, I guess your subconscious maybe the space to chew on some of these problems, right? Yeah. Where you've imbibed so much knowledge, you know, you've highlighted and thought about something, but then you need to stop thinking about it for a while and let it marinate in the subconscious. And then, you know, these flashes of insight that people have described, I, sometimes I get them in the middle of the night, like I just wake up from a dream and have them and I got to write it down. Or sometimes it's uh, in nature, taking a walk. But I think that's very important too. We can't just brute force our way into understanding. You know, there's this interplay between kind of the brute force reading intake and then just relaxing, meditating, sleeping, being bored, uh, letting your subconscious do the, the heavy lifting. And there's a, like you should be aware of the fact that there's a war for your attention going on. So there's a lot of, yeah. a, there's been better and better and better mechanisms that are designed to steal your attention. So I kind of see it as a war zone between my right for boredom yeah. <laughs> and the internet wanting your attention. In fact, um, Clubhouse as an app has been, I'm probably not gonna use Clubhouse much anymore. Is, uh, there's some aspect of my own inner loneliness and whatever it is that pulled me into Clubhouse a little yeah. bit too much to where, where it robbed me from that lonely time alone where I sit and listen to Bruce Springsteen and think about life, right? <laughs> so I, I wanna- That's way more important. <laughs> it's way, well, yeah, at least, in, you know, it's all in balance because there is a, a Clubhouse, like a lot of these social networks when you use right, can be a way to discover new ideas, new right. people. It's, yeah. But the boredom and just being alone with your thoughts is yeah. uh, priceless. Absolutely. And you got to know yourself, right? Like it took me a long time to realize I need solitude. Yeah. Like just how I'm wired, how I'm built. I need like an hour a day solitude. So you got to listen to that part of yourself. You might be compromising something like that where you feel like you always need to be with your girlfriend or whatever it may be. But I would suggest listening to that voice. Yeah, I tried to <laughs> I tried to remember things that made me feel good over time, like long term had positive impact and long term had negative impact and do more of the former and mm -hmm. less of the latter. Yeah. We don't often <laughs> think like that. You know, we, we talked offline about like carnivore diets, for example. I try to remember that carbs don't make me feel good. Yeah. That's what's in that's the hard. moment it's hard to remember it's hard. that. <laughs> it's hard. But you have to remember that that that's the case and in the same way exercise it's hard to remember that exercise makes me feel good uh like especially if I, when it's time to go to the gym especially right? when yeah. it's time to go to the gym but you should remember that because yeah. the kind of person you are without exercise for me yet just like he's beautifully said that you have to know yourself the kind of person i am without exercise is a less good person a, a person a person i'm less proud of yeah the food thing is so hard, by the way. I still, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've learned the lesson, like, don't eat that. <laughs> but then, you know, you go a few weeks of not eating whatever that is, and you're, you're feeling good. Yeah. And then you're, you're, I don't know, something creeps up inside you, like, ah, you could just have one, or you could just do this. But for me, it's sugar. Like, sugar just makes me feel terrible. But I always, not always, but if it's been a long time, I start to make that exception in my mind. Like, oh, you can have a little bit. Yeah. And then I eat it and I feel terrible. So I don't know how many times I've done that dance, but <laughs> it's not cool. Well, it depends on how painful it is. And then you learn the lesson. I have haven't. I actually embraced the fact that I'll never learn the lesson with vodka. Mm. Every time I drink, <laughs> especially with Russians, it's like I, I quit drinking every time. And then I forget there's like a slow drop off. It'll be like a two weeks and then- Nazdorovia. Um, Nazdorovia. <laughs> Very good. So it never makes me feel good. It never results in anything good, um, except the beautiful social chaos, yeah. which is ultimately somehow, there's value to chaos too. Yes. You know, there, yeah. There's value to that. Whatever the hell stupid stuff you do when you get trashed, the over the top emotion of love usually or whatever, yeah. camaraderie, there's value to that too. Like 
as as I get older, I realize because uh, the the world sometimes, especially when you get older, and the world wants you to be an adult. In order to maintain the youthful spirit, you have to use all the tools you can. Yeah, and alcohol is one of them. Right, to do all the stupid shit you can, even if you're like getting older. To lower the inhibitions and lower the again, it's that that taste of uncertainty that is the sweetness of life, right? To be able to go out and be a flaneur at a party and not really know what you're going to do, and it's we we have this draw to the wild side of life. Uh, as much as we try and build up order around ourselves, I think there's always going to be an appetite for that. Um, I've always, most of my life, I've always been a social drinker, but I actually gave up alcohol a year ago, and um, I would add that to the the idea, uh, the, the repertoire for dealing with bigger ideas because alcohol is fun. It's amazing, you know, good times. It can be analgesic. It can do all of the, it can give you all these benefits if you use uh, in the right amounts. But I got to the point personally where I was trying to wrestle with these ideas that are just so much bigger than me that I, and I have this backlog of books that was growing faster than I could read them that I just reached a point where I decided, um, I wanted to start making sacrifices toward attaining that. And alcohol was just an easy one. You know, it's you spend, even if you just drink socially on the weekends, you're probably spending five to 10 hours drinking and then maybe another, what, five to 10 hours recovering perhaps on the day after. Um, So it, it was a difficult transition initially, but once you get through a couple of months, I feel amazing without it. I sleep better than ever. My workouts are better than ever. I'm sharper than ever. I'm more lucid. So I'm, I'm not trying to be a proponent for like not drinking, but I just want but to you're say- you're a proponent for sacrifice. In some, I am a big proponent dimension. for sacrifice, yes. 